أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيء ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في العرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداءه مجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد ذرأنا لجهنم كثيرا من الجن والإنس لهم قلوبا لا يفقهون بها ولهم عيون لا يبصرون بها ولهم عذان لا يسمعون بها أولئك كلعن عام بل هم أضل أولئك هم الغافلون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Living in an era of awareness and insight has been our topic. Tonight is lecture number four. We have begun to now describe the dangers of a lack of insight. We talked about two nights ago the importance of basirat in Islam. We mentioned how the human being has two sets of eyes the eyesight and the insight, the eyes of our body and the eyes of our soul. And Islam equates vision to the eyes of the soul being open and alert. And for those individuals where the eyes of the internal kingdom are closed, ineffective, but the eyes of the body are open, Islam still considers that individual to be blind. And yesterday we looked at two very important historical references that talked about the effects of those who did not have insights. One was from Surah Tawbah, Ayat 107 and 108, where Allah relates the story of a masjid called Zirar and the effects of that. And also the conclusion or the effects of the story of the War of Sifin, how the Khawarij movement the Takfiri movement really began its bunyad, its root, its base, happened in that one moment where individuals weren't able to recognize the truth of Amir al-Mu'mineen versus the false tactics of someone like Mu'awiyah. The ayat that I am musalsal every single night in the khutbah reciting for all of you, as I mentioned in the second night, it will be the base of our discussion, is from Surah Al-A'raf. In the end, after the Qur'an describes the three causes that we talked about two nights ago, in the end it says that these people who have these three qualities are like cattle. Ulaika kal an'am. They're like cattle who follow the herd wherever they go. If the herd is going through, towards destruction, they follow that herd. If it's going through to, uh, towards salvation, they also follow that herd as well. And then the Qur'an at the end says, in fact, they're worse than cattle. They are amongst the ghafiloon. <clears throat> and I want to speak a little bit about ghaflat tonight. Because one of the most immediate results of a person who is not able to be insightful 
is that he or she falls into the, the, the disease and the problem of ghaflat. Ghaflat is used in Urdu, it's used in Farsi, it's used in Arabic as well. Ghafla is Arabi, Ghaflat is both Urdu and Persian. The best translation we have, you know, sometimes these languages of ours, Urdu, Arabic, and Persian, are such deep-rooted, rich languages that a, a very weak language like English cannot have a proper translation sometimes for the words. We do our best to accommodate, perhaps to summarize the meaning of the word, but we really sometimes don't grasp the true essence of that word when we translate. Something gets lost in translation. Ghaflat is a word such like that. We have in English something called heedlessness, inattentiveness. Someone who does not give any attention to a certain, let's say, word or a certain speech or a certain message, he is ghafil towards that message. He is heedless towards that message. And ghaflat is known as a sickness of the soul in the world of Islamic akhlaq. And the Quran time and time again talks about this idea, describes those who are ghafil and uses very harsh words sometimes. And the, and, and the one way that we can fight ourselves from this khabi ghaflat, from this sleep of heedlessness, is to open up our eyes of our insights. Surah Yusuf, ayat number, ayat number 7, talks about the qualities of those who are ghafil. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna ladina la yarujuna liqa'ana, number one. These are those individuals who have no hope or no desire for meeting us. Waradhu bil hayati dunya, wat ma'annu biha, look at this now. They are not only pleased with the life in this world, they are content as well. And there are those who are heedless towards our signs. Time and time again, there's a sign coming at us, either through a speech by an alim, or through experience in our life, or through a tragedy, or through a dua, or through advice given to us by another mu'min or a mu'mina. And time and time again, there's one warning after one warning after one warning. Or sometimes we read about those individuals who have lost their life at the age of 18, 16, 21, in the prime of their life. And yet we as young individuals sometimes believe, I still have 40 years, 45 years, 60 years to live. Let me live my life now and later on 50, 60, our son of Hajj, go to Hajj, labbaik, ya Allah, come back, clean as a baby and pray for my death. That's how we live. When in front of us with our own hands, we picked up the dirt with the shovel and we put it on a coffin and inside that coffin is a 16 year old boy. Haven't we done that? Sure we have. And for that moment, we're shaken. For that moment, we're taken back. We might even think for a moment, oh my God, what if that was me? But then immediately after that, that, that thought happens, another thought comes and says, no, no, no. Everybody else but me. I'm invincible to all these things. I'm immune to all these things. This is one in a million cases. Usually people live until they're 85, 90, 65, 70, I'm 18, I'm 21, I'm 15, I'm 14, I'm 24. I have, like I said before, many, many years to go. Allah is Rahman, Allah is Rahim. He'll forgive me, inshallah. These are the ayat of Allah, the signs of Allah. They're everywhere in front of us, and we're looking at them. But the problem is that we're not able to understand that these are warnings for us. The Quran says that these are people who don't have any hope to meet us. And what that means, the meeting of Allah is a whole different discussion. Liqa Allah in the Quran, meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a whole different discussion altogether. I don't have time for that. On top of that, there are people who not only are ravi with their life, but they have itminan with their life in this world as well. 
These are people who are ghafil to our signs. It's a very dangerous state to be somebody who's ghafil. Inshallah, I'll talk about number one, the cause of ghaflat in tonight's speech, and at the end, the solution to ghaflat as well. Again, all based on the Quran. We don't go anywhere outside the Quran, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If we don't tackle this ghaflat right away, the Quran warns us again. In Surah Namal, the Quran says, If this ghaflat persists and persists and persists and continues and continues and continues, the result of that is Allah comes and seals قلوبهم سمعهم أبصارهم our hearts, our ears, our eyes. Advice is given to you. People lived with the Holy Prophet, walked with the Holy Prophet, ate with the Holy Prophet. Every single dice of the Holy Prophet, they're there right beside him. Everything was there. When the Prophet left and left clean instructions on what to do after my death, they forgot about all that and they went towards their own path. The sheer presence of Surah Munafiqoon in the life of the Holy Prophet tells us that they were hypocrites in the life of the Holy Prophet. How could it be? You and I are right now able to and ready to give our life for the path of the Ahlul Bayt, and yet none of us have laid our eyes on these great individuals. There were people who were there, Mujud in Ghadir, people who were Mujud in Karbala. You know, we have, come, we, we have this idea where we respect and we elevate the Ashab of Imam Hussein, no doubt. We talked about that two nights ago. But there were some individuals, some quote-unquote companions, who were approached by Abba Abdullah. And they had a thousand excuses. When he changed his Hajj to Umrah and he was leaving Medina and Mecca towards Kufa, there was one companion, Imam Hussein, approached Ibn Dahaqi, his name was. Imam Hussein looks at him and says, have you heard the news that I'm going towards Kufa? He says, yes, I have. Now those who wanted to be with Imam Hussein, they would seek out Imam Hussein and beg to Allah, please, I really hope he chooses me to take, with, to take him with him. But those who do, didn't wish to come with Imam Hussein would literally, they say in the books, avoid him in the streets of Medina. Avoid eye contact, don't look at me. If he was walking down on one side street, they would cross the road to avoid crossing paths with Imam Hussein. Just because he might ask me to join him in his army. Ibn Dahaqi was such that Imam Hussein says, Jiatumuna li Nusrati, are you going to come and, and, and be my helper? He says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I'll come with you. Look, at, we, had, we also had these types of individuals who existed during the time of Imam Hussein as well. And he sits there and he negotiates with Imam Hussein. Listen very carefully. He says, Imam Hussein, I'll come with you to Karbala, no problem. But the moment that I feel like you can't win this war, I want you to let me go. Imam Hussein says, no problem. No problem. I don't force anybody. You were a man... Imam Hussein is telling him this now. You were a man who fought in Sifin against my father with Muawiyah. Your track record with Allah is not that great. I'm giving you an opportunity now to fix that track record. That's all I'm doing. If you think I need you for this mission, no, I don't need anybody. I'm giving you the opportunity. He says, thank you very much. And he arrives in the second of Muharram with Imam Hussein. Listen very carefully. Fifth Muharram, sixth Muharram, seventh Muharram comes, and these armies are coming in thousands and thousands on that side, and there's not a lot of action happening on Imam Hussein's side. 
As you know, Ubaidullah sent troops in packages and bunches towards Karbala, not all at once. On the 8th of Muharram, he looks, he sees 25, 30,000 on one side, a handful, maybe 70 on the other side. And he approaches Imam Hussein. He says, we had a deal. Do you remember we had a deal? He says, yes, of course, I remember we had a deal, yeah. So, well, to be honest, it doesn't look good for you. There's thousands on this side. There's 70 of us on this side. I want to cash in on my deal. If it's okay with you, I want to go back to Medina. He says, no problem. But no, I don't have a horse for you to go back. I don't have anything for you. He says, no problem, no problem. I've stashed my horse down the way. I put him in a tent and he's ready. The man walks down the road, mounts his horse and rides back to Medina. I mean, there were people who landed on the Khak of Karbala. People who had the opportunity to be the Ashab of Imam Hussein, who today are revered and respected like no group of people is in history. He was there, moments away, days away from serving the Imam, and he left. He fled. His ghaflat got the best of him. His heedlessness got the best of him. He wasn't able to decipher that yes, this might be on the zahir, a lose-lose situation. But when you sacrifice your entire life for the mission of Abu Abdullah, that's guaranteed victory for eternity. And if he had that chishmi basirat open, he was able to see that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So what causes this ghaflat? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam He has a very beautiful tradition. I want to speak a little bit about this tradition tonight to remove perhaps some misconceptions in our youth. I have this discussion almost everywhere I go, wherever I travel to. My first time here, I also want to have that same discussion with all of you as well. He says, رَأَسُ كُلِّ خَطِيَةَ الْحُبُّ الدُّنِيَا Very famous tradition, a very simple one. The head, رَأَسُ in Arabic is head. Here he means the center, the nucleus of every khata that we do. Every mistake that we make, every sin that we commit, every uh, problem that we have in the path of Allah is one cause, حُبُّ dunya, is love of this dunya. Now, let me pause here let me explain to you what this means. The misconception amongst our youth is this, that Islam wants us to live a poverty-stricken life. From the member, we always hear about Imam Ali giving talaq and divorce to the dunya three times. When he married that dunya, I have no idea that he gave talaq to. I don't know. Or we hear him very famously saying, the snot of an animal is worth more to me than this dunya is. Or we say that while he's tying his shoes together by a rope, he says, this rope that's holding my shoes on my feet, the rope is worth more to me than this dunya. And we think the dunya means this physical planet that we live in. Where Islam says that as long as you lived, as long as you wear ripped up clothing, as long as you drive a clunker, live in a shack, don't have the latest and greatest, then you are on the path of piety, mashallah. Otherwise, if you make a little bit of money, mashallah, the halal way, you have a nice furnished home, a decent car, a nice phone, nice libas, you are far from piety and taqwa. This is a misconception. It's wrong. And I want to clear that up for all of you tonight. And I ask my youth, I make it a point to stick around after the majlis. If you have any confusion, any questions, please come and ask me. If not, I have a London SIM. You can call me 24-7 whenever you want to and ask me. If you take me out for coffee, I'll come with you. As long as you buy me coffee, I'll come with you. But you're paying, not me. 
These are pounds, not dollars. Expensive. No problem. But don't leave here confused. Pick my brain, sit me down, challenge me. Be respectful about it, but challenge me, no doubt. It shows at least that you're listening. Thank you, thank you for that. So what is the solution? What does the dunya mean? What does the akhirat mean? If we understand this, then the first cause of ghaflat being hubbul dunya will understand at the same time. We are trying to avoid the path of heedlessness. Because the Quran talks about the fact that those who don't have basirat, the, 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 the stage that's worse than that is the stage of ghaflat. Imam Khomeini rahmatullah alayhi, Alamam Majisi rahmatullah alayhi, talks about the fact that dunya and akhirat are not physical worlds. There are states of existences. Listen very carefully. Meaning he says that the dunya, those elements that pull you away from the dhikr of Allah, those elements combined is called the dunya. And those elements that pull you towards the dhikr of Allah, those elements are called the akhirah. Meaning it's very possible that you live in the dunya but be the Ahli Akhirat. So the dunya number one is not a physical world that we live in. It is a state of existence. Sometimes, you know, we have been to Qabristans, we've been to cemeteries, we've been there during the entire funeral process We've sat there and we've heard the alim read talqeen where, you know, the waris shakes the, the, the shoulders of the marhum. And in that talqeen, the first thing it says is isma ifham, isma ifham. Listen, understand, fulan ibn fulan or fulan binti fulan, for example. That listen, I'm talking to you. And then it goes through, if ever you've read the translation of talqeen, and I urge you to do that. It's a very interesting conversation you're having with a marhum. You're saying, look, you're going to be asked these questions. What is your rab? Who is your rab? Who is your nabi? Where is your qibla? What is your kitab? Who is your imam? Okay? These are questions that grade three dinyat Sunday school are answered. An eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old right now, if I brought them up to the stage, I ask him, who is your Lord? They'll say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I ask them, what is your book? They'll say, the Quran. If I ask them, where is your qibla? They'll say, the Kaaba. No problem. So what's the problem? Because the Dalqeen says, don't be afraid of these questions. Your answer is this. And it gives you the answer. When you go a little bit deeper into the falsafa of death and mult, you'll understand that when you are asked these very simple questions, they don't ask you up here. They ask you in here. Understand this, please. If you have spent your entire life making somebody else, something else, your Rabb, and you're asked who is your Rabb, you will say that thing, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have made your entire life Someone else is your Rasul and someone else is your Imam when you're asked who your Rasul is and who your Imam is, you'll say somebody else, not the Holy Prophet and not the 12 Imams. Because at that stage, what ends up happening when you become the Ahlul Dunya, that Dunya sinks inside of you. That's why they say, live in the Dunya, don't allow the Dunya to live inside of you. Or when Amir al says that when the boat is on the water, it sails. When the water is in the boat, it sinks. We are here to live in the dunya. We're not here to allow the dunya to live inside of us. Because the dunya, like I said, is a state of existence. Not a physical world. That's point number one. Point number two. 
The Holy Prophet says, Al Dunya Dunya Nan. There are two dunyas. Al Dunya Balehun wa Al Dunya Malauna. Very, very carefully. The dunya that you can attain success in and the dunya that is cursed in the eyes of Allah. What's the difference? How do you understand the difference? Yes, everything I said about how Imam Ali described the dunya is accurate, sahih. Absolutely, he said these things. But in Nahj al he also praises the dunya as well. He says this dunya is a place where Allah's wahi came down. This is the bazaar of worship for the abd of Allah. This is where angels descend on Shabi Qadr. This is the dunya where you can attain Jannat from this dunya. This dunya is very important. Imam Rada alayhi salatu was salam. Listen to this hadith. He says that the world, this dunya, is a bridge. And you don't build homes on bridges. Subhanallah. Digest that for a while. A fool will put a home on a bridge. Why? That bridge is not meant to host the weight of that house. The bridge is meant for transport from one side of the bridge to another side of the bridge. That's all it's there for. It's a wasila for your actual existence. But, 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 if the bridge breaks, if the bridge collapses, if the bridge is out, you're stuck. The bridge has the ahmiyat, but the bridge is the wasila of the maqsad, not the maqsad itself. Understand? The bridge is the avenue for your destination, not the destination itself. And those who allow the dunya to live inside of them have taken this dunya to be the end all and be all. And that's their fault. That's their um, um, loss. That's their failure. So what do we do? On one side we have this idea of Mina Mu'mineen cursing the dunya. On one side we have him praising the dunya. What do we do? How do we understand it? Let me tell you a very brief story. Shaykh Osama was here in the month of Ramadan and he told me that this Lutin community loves stories. I said, okay. For purification of our souls and wisdom, please recite aloud, Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. We have many stories in our back, in our back pocket, so let's see what happens. This uh, story is a very famous one, one that you sometimes find in Irfanic books. There was a boy who was being chased by a lion. All of you with me, inshallah? Everyone's here? Okay. You know, the first day, the guest is a little bit nervous and the host is a little bit nervous. The guest is cautious of what he says, and the host is also very cautious. I'm a new face, and all of you are also for me new faces. After four days now, you're, I'm one of you now. So there's a boy who's running for his life from a lion. I don't know how many of you have, how many of you have been chased by lions before, but this boy was being chased by a lion. Very interesting story. In the distance, he sees a well. There's a well, there's a metal hanging, there's rope that goes down, halfway down the well. And the water is a little bit deep down in the well, correct? He decides to himself, or he tells him, if I'm able to sprint to the well, then that's my nijat, that's my salvation against the lion. He sprints and he jumps inside the well, grabs the rope halfway down the well, and begins to sway back and forth. The lion now is perched on top of the well. He can't go in. This young boy thinks to himself, eventually, if I wait long enough, the lion will get tired, and he'll go chase other boys. He'll leave me alone. And he does what I would never give anyone any advice to do. He looks down. 
He looks down, he sees from the water the mouth of a crocodile waiting for him. It gets better. On top is a lion, at the bottom is a crocodile. He again thinks to himself, eventually the crocodile will go away and the lion will go away. Right? It's a youth, right? Ghurur, invincibility, libra takabur. When he thinks that, he hears the sound of ever so slowly chewing. He looks up on the rope, he sees a black mouse and a white mouse, ever so slowly chewing on his rope. Let me paint the picture now. Top is a lion, bottom is a crocodile. The black mouse, the white mouse are chewing ever so slowly and this bichara is holding on the rope for a dear life. If I asked you what advice would you give this young man, what would you say? If I asked you, or if I told you that you and I were in the exact same situation right now, what would you say? The story says the lion represents death chasing us. The crocodile's mouth open represents our grave open and waiting for us. The black mouse represents night. The white mouse represents day. Time. Ever so slowly chewing at the rope of our life. And we are this child clutching this rope for dear life. The story gets better. How better can it be, right? It gets better. In this state, in this halat, in this complete scenario, stuck to the side of the well is fresh honey. Fresh honey. Now, fresh honey, for those of you who have actually tasted fresh honey, not this Western stuff, it's all sugar. Fresh honey is, it has a certain look to it, has a certain smell to it. And it tastes amazing. He thinks to himself that I've been running all day from the light, I'm starving. Let me sway over and begin to eat with my fingers this disgusting honey that is completely glued to the side of this well. There's flies around it, there's mud around it, but he's sitting there devouring this honey with his fingers. Now you would stop and think to yourself that look, my friend, leave the honey alone. Get yourself out of this predicament for a second. You can have all the honey you want outside. But he's consuming the honey to the point where he forgets about the state that he's in. The story says that that honey represents that dunya that's mal'una, that's cursed. Why? It's that dunya that takes us away from our actual existence and state in this world. It makes us forget about where we actually are and where we're headed. A lot of us are consumed by this dunya. So much so that we don't understand that there is a world waiting for us. The Quran says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنِيَا وَأَنْ أَخْرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ When it comes to the dunya, they know everything about the zahir of the dunya. But when it comes to the akhirat, they're ghafil. They're heedless. No idea. I don't know about here, but in Toronto where I'm from, university, first year university when I went, a lot of my classes, there were about 300 to 400 students. First year classes usually in Toronto are very large in numbers. Psychology and, uh, you know, uh, other courses as well. So you are one of 400 students. Okay, follow the example here, please. When it comes time for final exams, in order for them to host that many students, they need to use the largest auditorium on campus. Okay? So I remember walking into my first examination hall in the first university in Toronto, and the hall was beautiful. And I want you to imagine there is a, a, a young guy First year uni, first exam, he walks in, it's a massive hall. They usually choose the most beautiful auditorium on campus to host that many students. 
He walks in, he thinks, wow, look at this hall. There's crown molding, French windows, iPad on every single one of the desks. There's cushioned chairs, smart boards, carpet. What a beautiful, beautiful hall. And for the first half an hour of the exam, he's just awed by the examination hall. Until the professor comes and taps him on the shoulder and says, Buddy, you're not here to examine and be awed by the examination hall. You're here to write the exam. Oh. If I was an Urdu alim, I would say, Majmah ha Sometimes we are stuck in this dunya by the examination hall. We're awed by this dunya, everything and anything. What we don't realize, we're not here to fall in love with the dunya. We're here to write the exam in the dunya. Understand? Sometimes we are distracted. Sometimes we are pulled. Sometimes we are blinded by what we believe to be the beauties of this world. When you compare the akhirah and the dunya, this dunya is a mirage. It's not real. Nothing in the akhirah can compare to this dunya. It's far greater in that world. And sometimes we are stuck in the idea of this dunya and we are devouring ourselves with this dunya. Those elements that pull you away from the dhikr of Allah, those things are ra'se kulli khatiyya, as Imam Sadiq says. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Otherwise, the reality is this, from my youth especially, what we need today in the Shia world, in the West, in the UK, are professionals. We need Shia doctors. We need Shia lawyers. We need Shia businessmen, Shia accountants, Shia nurses. We need professionals who are educated, who are making good money, who have good salaries, who have a good life. There's nothing wrong with it. If you've worked very hard, if you've worked very hard to get to the point where you are a professional, and with that comes a very nice salary, Bismillah, enjoy that salary. But where Islam draws the line, this is very important. It's not about the earning in this dunya. It's about attaching yourself to this dunya. Something called zuhud that all of you have heard several times. Zuhud is the detachment of this world. We're fine. Very nice home, mashallah. Driving a very nice car. The best of clothes. No problem. That's how a moment should look like. A moment should not look like you have patched up clothing, ripped up clothes, unkept beard, a jeep bal, you look dirty, and you think this is the path of piety. No. Iman and faith is that you are a beautiful Christian of Allah on the outside and on the inside as well. So don't let anyone tell you that Islam is about poverty. Because the reality is that Amir al says that if faqr, if poverty was a man, I would have killed that man. I would have killed that man. Why? Because poverty breeds kufr. Remember that. Fakr breeds kufr. When you are living a life of poverty and poverty and poverty, eventually you say, why Allah, you have this dushmani with me. The whole world is now doing taraqi. My neighbor, my brother, my sibling, my kids are way past me. I'm still stuck in this rut. I come to Shabir Juma. I come to Mahar Ramadan. I come to Maharam, but you haven't blessed me yet. And now you begin to question Allah being your raziq. It's dangerous. And that plant or that seed is planted by poverty. But where Islam draws the line is attachment. Don't give it a value higher than it already has. Right? If you totaled your Bentley, it's okay. You still have your faith. If something happened, let's say, and you lost your job, don't worry. The walayat of Amir al will help you get your other job, inshallah. If. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We're starting a nice salwa, please, ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Because the reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi that I created this entire universe for you, insan. 
and I made you in son for me. We need individuals. What I would love more than anything else is 20 years from now I come back to this community with my cane, my broken back, and my white beard, and I see these young kids who are 8, 9, 10 now, 20, 25, in the prime of their life, and there are successful Shia believers in the Luton community who are individuals who are impactful in society. We see them in hospitals. We see them in courtrooms. We see them in high positions. They have their iman, they have their hijab, they have their beard, they have their salat, everything. At the same time, they're enjoying the fruits of their hard work from now. This is what we need. But don't attach yourself. Don't attach yourself. Amir al says, if you are going to sell your soul out in this world, it better be for a price higher than Jannah. Because that's what you're giving up. If there's anything in this world higher in price than heaven, then no problem. But that's what the price is. Because we've seen individuals who attach themselves to this dunya, and the first thing that goes is their iman, is their faith, is their piety. And that's the problem. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So what is our solution to this ghaflat? There is an act of worship in Mustahab Salat I'm sure most of you are aware of called Salat al It is a Mustahab Salat to be read between Maghrib and Isha It's a very powerful Salat It takes all but five minutes to recite the name Ghufayla comes from Ghafala, the same root as Ghafla. And look at the philosophy behind the injection of this Salat between Maghrib and Isha. The ulama say, our Ghaflat as the insan happens more at night than it does in the daytime. Our youth especially ask yourself, when the sun sets, that's usually when the shaitan inside of us awakens. Conversations on the phone that we have at 12 o'clock at night, as opposed to 12 o'clock noon, are two different conversations. Places we visit at 11 o'clock at night on a Friday, as opposed to 11 a.m. on a Monday, are two different places. Things that we do and things that we discuss at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or 1 o'clock at night on a Sunday or 1 o'clock in the morning on, on, on a Sunday are two different things altogether. For some reason at night, when the night falls, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slowly creeps out of our system and shaitan slowly enters our system. The ulama say the majority of our sins are committed at night. Now, it's a general statement. It could be the opposite. Who knows? To rectify that, the Ahlul Bayt have said that before the night even is there, recite this Salat al If you Google it, you'll have it there. Everything is there. It's very easy. There are two verses to be read in the first rakat and the second rakat. The first rakat, we are asked to remember the story of Nabi Yunus. After Alhamd in Surah Anbiya, Ayat 87-88, the hukum in the Salat is to read these ayats. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَظَنُونِ ذَهَبًا مَغَاذِبًا فَذَلَّا أَلَّا نَقْدِرَا عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَا فِي ظُلَمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانِكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ فَاسْرَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِلْ Mu'minin. Beautiful story, Nabi Yunus. He got a little impatient with his, with his community. He's telling them to believe in one Allah, believe in one Allah, believe in one Allah. They refuse. He gets frustrated. He goes and leaves them. Allah says, you did a tarqi awla. A tarqi awla is not a sin. In the world of prophethood, a tarqi awla is that when you leave, the better of the two mustahabats. 
There's one mustahab and there's a better mustahab. You choose the lesser of the two. That's called tarq awla. Tarq means to leave in Farsi. Awla means the better of the two. Thal guna. And the result of that is what? Very famously, he spends time in the belly of this whale. Now, some say 40 nights, some say 40 years. Doesn't matter. The Quran says that in that halat, fanada fi dhulimat, in the darkness, he called out. Let me metaphorically paint this picture for all of you. The mammal in which Nabi Yunus resided in is a mammal that does not swim on the surface level of the ocean. Okay? It's a mammal that swims at the deepest part of the ocean. It comes up for air, it goes back down. It does not. Once in a while you see it at the surface level, but it resides mostly in the deepest portion of the ocean. Now I want you to imagine metaphorically now, my youth, please follow me here. I want you to imagine that this prophet of Allah is inside the darkest portion of this mammal. The mammal is inside the darkest portion of the ocean. Darkness upon darkness. A lot of you and I, a lot of us in this room and in that room are right now scratching rock bottom. Everybody in this room is not free of test. It's not free of hardship. It's not free of struggle. Everybody here has a story to tell. Some mushkilat, some parashani, some sort of adversity that we're going through. And that's all part of this dunya. The Quran says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي kabad." We have created the insan in the cradle of distress. We put him there. We put one test after one test after one test. You're not alone. Everyone here is going through some sort of battle. If you are single, you're worried about your education. You're worried about your spouse. You're worried about your future. If you are married, you don't have kids yet, you're worried about having kids. If you have kids, you're worried about those kids. If your kids are married, you're worried about your kids' kids. There's a constant state of anxiety inside of us. Some of us have health problems. Some of us have lost our children. Some of us are going through a very ugly divorce. Some of us can't find a job. Some of us can barely make mortgage payments. Some of us are fighting shaitan. Some of us can't get to Allah. A lot of us in this room and that room are fighting some demon in their life. There's nobody in this room that's free of problems, myself included. Nobody. And we have two possible solutions. One is that we curl up in a ball and we allow the dunya to rip our faith out of us and we become the ahl dunya Or the other solution is that we understand that the dunya is made for that purpose, to test a mu'min. And I want to make sure I show Allah that He is worthy of the fact that He chose me to test and I want to elevate myself beyond this test. What does Nabi Yunus do? In the darkest portion of the mammal, in the darkest portion of the ocean. Metaphorically, He is the darkness upon darkness. A lot of us right now are at this state in our life. We don't tell anybody, we don't share it, we don't call anybody, we put on a brave face, we walk through that door, a smile, salam, kya hale, khairit, alhamdulillah, everything. We go home, we cry to Allah, we beg to Allah. All of us, some of us, are going through hell right now. We don't know what to do. What does Nabi Yunus do? Fanada fi dhulamat, Allah ilaha illa anta subhanika. First thing is, there is no Allah but you. Glory be to you. Inni kuntum min al If anyone has put anyone in this state, it's me. I've done dhulm against myself. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands that this banda of mine won't come towards me unless I put a problem on the path. Because so long as things are great, we forget Allah. The moment that things are wrong, Janamaz is out, tasbih in the hand, amal this, amal that, 
Allah, 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 Allah. And the moment that that problem is solved, the Janamaz is folded back up on the shelf until the next problem arrives. This is how we are. So Allah knows that look, until and unless I put a little crack on his sidewalk to make him understand I'm still here, he will forget about me. He'll forget about me. That's how we are. Until we say, look, Allah, this state that I'm in, nobody is to blame but me. I recognize that. I ask you, please, don't leave my side. I have nobody but you. And the Quran says that we heard Nabi Yunus, we freed Nabi Yunus. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we'll do the exact same thing for the Mu'mineen as well. We talked about Muslimin versus Mu'mineen. If we are able to understand that when a problem, a hardship comes into our life, that hardship is not an avenue to run from Allah. It's an avenue to run to Allah where we glorify Him, we praise Him, and we tell ourselves that I am to blame. The next step is what? Allah will help, Allah will help us. Allah will create avenues there. The Quran says, He will give you risk from a source that you never even accounted for. I lost my job, one door was slammed shut. A door I never even thought existed. All of a sudden opened, I walked in, and there's my nijat. But one solution to ghaflat that we have, one of many, is to now begin to inject this namaz ghufayla inside of our everyday life. I ask my youth, please, those who are regular prayers of salat, in between Maghrib and Isha, hold your smartphone and, and read it until you have those ayats memorized. It has immense power to it. You're begging Allah, protect me from the ghaflat of the night. I'm about to enter shaitan's arena. I want to be able to have an armor on me. And that armor is known as namaz ghufayla. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Because the reality is that we don't believe in this, in this idea that it's too late. We have in our, in, in our books 95-year-old men coming and knocking on the door of Imam Sadiq and saying, please, Teach me the basics of the deen. A 95 years old, year old man. A 95 year old man. His whole life is gone. Our sixth imam brings him in, sits him down, and teaches him. He doesn't say you're a 95 year old man and one foot in the grave. There's no fight that now. Never think that. My elders, my respective elders, and my beloved youth, you could live a life of Satan up until now. We believe in the karam and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the most beautiful story we have from Karbala that is a representation of this is janab e Hur. janab e Hur. Let me explain to you what janab e Hur did and what he was responsible for. Then you can appreciate that when he came to Abu Abdullah, Janab al as many of you know, intercepted Imam Hussein on his way to Kufa and forced Abu Abdullah towards Karbala. Otherwise, the fear was that if Imam Hussein had reached Kufa, then again, this passion amongst the Shias of Kufa would have been reignited and they would have again been right beside Imam Hussein. So Ubaidullah sends Hur and says, intercept Hussein and make him enter Karbala. Number one. Number two, that individual that forced Imam Hussein to uplift his tents from the banks of Farat to away from Farat was Hur. The first individual to put tears in the eyes of Bibi Zainab was Hur. Because when Bibi Zainab heard the word Karbala from Hur's lips, she realized that this is where the war will happen. Every meeting that Umar ibn Sa'd, Ubaidullah, Shimr, Hurmala, Hur had about killing Imam Hussein, about looting the tents, 
about setting those tents on fire. Hor was mojud in those meetings, and he never once said a single word. Hor was responsible for many atrocities to Abba Abdullah and his family and friends. Why do I say this? Because if there is one story of hope in this entire tragedy of Karbala for our youth, it's a story of Hur. As difficult of a life as you have lived, as many mistakes as we have made, we cannot say that we have made the same mistakes as Hur ibn Yazid has made, can we? We can't. And yet in a moment, a literal moment, he went from La'natullah alayhi to alayhi salam in one moment. And that was due to the mercy of Abba Abdullah. We're sitting on the farsh of Abba Abdullah. We are sinful people. We cannot go anywhere without the mercy of Allah. We ask Allah bihaqq Hussein ibn Ali to forgive our sins tonight for the sake of that moment when Hur came to Abba Abdullah tied up begging for his mercy. And nowhere do we see Imam Hussein say, Hur, you have the audacity to come to me? You are the one that caused so much pain. I'm in this predicament because of you. You want me to be merciful towards you? Imam Ali says, true courage, true forgiveness is when you have the ability to overpower the enemy and you choose to forgive him. When that meeting happened between Imam Hussein and Abu Hur, he says, I cannot let you go any further. You have to go this way towards Karbala. Imam Hussein says that may your mother weep over you. That's what they would say in the Arab culture when somebody was very mad at them. And usually there was a response that's even harsher than that. But look at Hur's response. Hur's response says, Hussein, if your mother had been anybody else but Fatima, I would have responded. Meaning that if he had anything in his heart, he had love for the mother of Hussein. You and I also have love for the mother of Hussein as well. If he's Qabil Rahmat, we're also Qabil Rahmat as well. They stop there. It's time for prayer. Imam Hussein sets up his jama'at. Jalab al Hur, some books say, actually read Salat behind Abba Abdullah. Afterwards, Jalab al Hur is complaining of thirst. The water has run out. Imam Hussein hears his complaints. He approaches Imam Hussein. He approaches Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas and says, Abbas, our enemies are thirsty. Give them water. Let them quench their thirst. The books say that not only did Hur quench his thirst, his companions, his family, his horses quenched their thirst. And they drank until they were completely content. Why is this important? Because on the day of the morning of the day of Ashura, Janabi Hur is standing there. He can hear Al Atash, Al Atash from the Khaimah of Abu Abdullah. And he's standing there in this state of complete confusion. His slave comes to him and says, Hur, what are you thinking about? You're so confused. You look worried. If I was to ask anybody who is the bravest soldier of all, they would say Hur is. He would say to a slave, do you hear those children crying for water? He says, yes, I do. He says, يُخَيْرُ nafsi بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ nar." I'm standing here and I want to choose between hell and between heaven. 
And he realizes his insight all of a sudden opens up. His ghaflat is removed. And he realizes that this side of 30,000 people, albeit the majority, is the path towards Jahannam. And the face of the son of Fatima is the path of Jannat. He asked Umar ibn Sa'd, Umar ibn Sa'd, today is Ashura, the tent of Muharram. What will happen today? He says, Hor, blood will be shed today. Bodies will be destroyed today. Bodies will be trampled today. He saw 30,000 on one side, 72 on another. He asked his son, he asked his slave to tie my hands, put a rope around my eyes, mount me on my horse, take me towards my Mullah Hussein. As they approach the khaim of Imam Hussein, the sounds of a horse can be heard by Abba Abdullah. He says, Abbas, go see who it is. Abbas goes and sees that on his way here are three individuals. One has his hands tied. One is blindfolded. He says, Mola, I don't think it's a dushman of ours. I think you should come and see. When he comes, he sees that from a distance, the horse stops. Hora dismounts from the horse. And he comes approaching Imam Hussein like a slave approaches his master. He falls at the feet of Abba Abdullah. He says, Yabna Rasulullah, please accept this apology from Hur. Imam Hussein picked him up, hugged him, kissed him, untied his ropes. He says, you're forgiven, Hur, but I also want to apologize to you. When you were my dushman, I gave you every drop of my water. But now that you are my akhi and my companion, you've come to me when I don't have a drop of water to give you. He says, Mola, I don't want a drop of water from you. I want to sacrifice me and my son on your mission. He says, yeah, it's, it's granted. When the father and the son, Hur and his son, are going back and forth, who should give their life first? The son says, Baba, let me go first before you. The son of Hur goes, fights, is hit by many swords, falls from the horse and calls out for his father. And listen to this very carefully. This is enough to break our heart. When he calls for Hur, Hur begins to go towards his son. Imam Hussein stops him and says, Hur, Hur, that's your Jalan son. No Buddha Bab should go towards his Javan son. I am here. Abbas is here. You stay where you are. We'll go towards your Javan son. Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas carried the son back to the Khaimah. Hold his last ziyarat. I say, Mola, you were so concerned about a Javan son and a Buddha Bab. Come on the day of Ashura, your Ali Akbar will sit there and complain. There's a bite in my chest. When he's left this world, there's not one individual left to say, Hussein, your Ali Akbar is your Javan son. Hussein, you are a Buddha Bab. Leave it alone. We'll bring your son back to the Khema. No, at that moment, there is no Abbas. There is no Qasim. No, no Muhammad. Instead, Imam Hussein does what? He calls the small kids of the Bani Hashim. Come and help me. Carry my Akbar back to the Khaimah. Sayyal Mulladina Dhalumu Ayyamun Qalibin Yan Qalibun Inna Lillahi Wa Inna Ilayhi Rajaun We ask you Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to accept this Qalil Ibadat Insha'Allah We ask you Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to protect us from this disease of Ghaflat Insha'Allah Give us the inspiration to open up our eyes of the internal kingdom We ask you Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Within the hearts of our youth, convert the pleasure of sin to the pleasure of worship, inshallah. There's so much injustice, tyranny, oppression all over the world. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's one Hussein in Ghaybat. Hasten that reappearance of that Hussein and allow us to be as Ansar when he comes, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.